We have always been fascinated with the idea of our species gaining the traits and strengths of other animals. From the ancient myths of the Minotaur and Centaurs to the controversial scientific experiments of the 20th century, the quest to merge human and animal characteristics has captivated our imagination and driven us to explore the boundaries of biology. Today on Historical Corals, we dive into the stories of human-animal hybrids, from the legends of Greek mythology to the daring experiments of Ilya Ivanov in the Soviet Union and the cutting-edge research of modern science. Join us as we unravel the ethical dilemmas, the scientific pursuits, and the timeless human curiosity that have fueled these extraordinary endeavors. Stay tuned, because history is about to get wild. Welcome back to Historical Corals. I am your host, Tyler Eckhart. Um, super happy to be back this week with a full episode. Uh, sorry again about last week, just needing to take some extra time there and just wanted to do at least something for you and have a short story. Today we're going to go over the full uh, full extent of uh, everything that I had researched and prepped essentially for last week, but uh, this time with uh, with a bit more. So uh, today we'll be going over the history of human humanity's fascination with like human animal hybrids, um, the and the essentially what is the journey to humans trying to gain those traits, trying to gain actually like make some of those myths into reality or um, times where humans have thought that that was actually possible just by interbreeding uh, and a couple of different stories there, just uh, some interesting. Uh, just an interesting collection of stories essentially uh, about that today. So uh, we'll be going over that. And then next week we'll kind of be going back into the uh, regular uh, episodes again, the regular routine of uh, just, you know, picking a subject and really deep diving into like a, either a quarrel or a quarrel or a battle. Again, this is more, uh, more or less just humanity's quarrel with uh, nature <laughs> trying to make nature do what it wants. <clears throat> that being said, I don't have a lot of announcements for today, so let's go ahead and just dive right into it, shall we? You are listening to Historical Quarrels. The pursuit of human-animal hybridization... Hybridiz... Hybridization... Oh my god. Hybridization. Hybridization. God damn it. You know, I, I'm... Fuck it. We're just going to go with it, has been driven by a mix of scientific curiosity, potential medical advancements, and philosophical questions about the nature of humanity. Early 20th century experiments, such as those by Soviet biologist Ilya Ivanov, aimed to explore the genetic and evolutionary connections between humans and primates by attempting to create human-chimpanzee hybrids, also known as humanzees, uh, as the title of this episode would have alerted you to. This research was partially motivated by a desire to validate evolutionary theories and push the boundaries of biological science. Also to make uh, maybe a certain Russian dictator a little happy by having super soldiers. Yeah, that could have, it would have also been part of the, uh, the desire, the push there. In recent decades, the focus has shifted towards practical medical applications. Scientists hope to create chimeras, animals with human cells, to address organ shortages for transplantation. By growing human-compatible organs in animals like pigs or monkeys, researchers aim to provide a renewable source of organs that are less likely to be rejected by the human immune system. Which is good for me, because I have something called a bicuspid aortic valve disease. Uh, My options are, when I turn a certain age, is I get open-heart surgery, and to either wait for a donor, uh, somehow, to get my valve replaced... Uh, or, you know, I could probably just live out most of my life and be fine as long as I like work out and run every day, which I'm finding harder and harder to do. I need to do it though. I'm going to fucking do it. Um, or you get like this, they have these like little plastic, um, imagine like a cap essentially for like your heart valve and it goes on and it functions like, um, like a regular aortic valve should, and it'd have three flaps instead of like the two flaps going. So um, I am also kind of for this <laughs> growing human compatible organs and pigs and monkeys because 
uh, for me personally, I have some stake in the game, right? You know, uh, other people can see that too much as like playing God or acting like God, but I mean, not really. It's just science, man. <laughs> just trying to make things easier for people uh, that have uh, disabilities uh, or defects, you know, trying to fix it. Uh, these efforts also contribute to a better understanding of devel- de- uh, developmental biology and genetic engineering. However, these scientific pursuits are definitely fraught with ethical dilemma- dilemmas, including concerns about the welfare of the animals used in experiments and the moral implications of creating beings that blur the line between species. And um, I understand concerns about the welfare of animals and everything, but same time, man, it's- <laughs> you need to test some shit out on living things. And, um, I prefer that we do that on animals as opposed to just humans and risking human life uh, over like an animal life. And most of the time the animals are going to die in just as gruesome and horrifying, um, deaths anyways out in the wild, like a deer, uh, a deer out in the wild is definitely going to get like caught either by a bear or a wolf or some mountain lion and essentially be tortured sometimes uh, eaten alive as you know, not as, you know, great as just well i guess i'd say being eaten alive and then being tor- uh, being tortured by being experimented upon probably about equal pain um, in all honesty so uh you know, kind of uh, pick or choose there uh but yeah um so those those are some of the issues let's go ahead and get into our timeline now so we're uh these kind of first started we can go all the way back to you know uh, s- We're talking like start a civilization, right? Where humans were drawing um, cave paintings with uh, humans with animal heads and everything's like that. But uh, the real, the first time where there's been like a story put to it or like an idea of like a man and a um, animal being combined together uh, would be essentially the Minotaur uh, as far as like a story uh, involved with it. The tale of the Minotaur is one of the most fascinating and enduring myths from ancient Greek mythology. It encapsulates the themes of hubris, punishment, and heroism. Uh, according to the myth, the Minotaur was a creature with the body of a man at the head of a bull. This monstrous being was the offspring of Pasiphae, the wife of King Min- Minos of Crete, and a majestic bull sent by the god Poseidon. Uh, Poseidon being a furry obviously just wanted to watch his favorite bull fuck a human for some reason. And it's kind of gross, but it is what it is. You know, gods be doing whatever gods want to be doing. You can't do shit about it. Right. Cause you know, it's the gods. The story begins with uh, Minos praying to Poseidon for a sign to secure his rule rule over Crete. Uh, Poseidon sent a beautiful white bull from the sea, which Minos was supposed to sacrifice to the God. However, enchanted by the bull's beauty, Minos kept it for himself and sacrificed another bull instead, incurring Poseidon's wrath. (laughs) And so, in retaliation for not sacrificing the white bull, Poseidon was like, I'm going to make your wife fuck the bull. (laughs) So he cursed uh, Pasiphae to fall madly in love with the bull, and consumed by her unnatural desire, Pasiphae sought the help of Daedalus, a skilled craftsman and inventor, Daedalus constructed a hollow wooden cow uh, covered in real cowhide in which Pacific concealed herself co- to consummate her union with the bull. So she, <laughs> she fucking uh, catfished the bull to get laid by it. Um, and the result of this union was the Minotaur, a hybrid creature that was neither fully human nor entirely beast. The monstrous nature of the Minotaur posed a significant problem for King Minos, who was both ashamed and fearful of the creature. To contain it, Minos ordered Daedalus to construct an elaborate labyrinth beneath the palace uh, in Knossos, a maze so complex that no one could escape it. The Minotaur was kept in the labyrinth and fed with human tributes sent from Athens. The tribute was a form of penance for the death of Minos, uh, Minos's son, and Throgios, who was killed in Athens under suspicious circumstances. Every nine years, seven young men and seven young women from Athens were sent to Crete to be devoured by the Minotaur. This gruesome cycle continued until the hero Theseus volunteered to be part of the tribute. With the help of uh, Ariadne, Ariad, oh my god, fucking Greek names, Ariadne, Minos's daughter, who fell in love with him, Theseus, um, Theseus w- managed to navigate the labyrinth. Ariadne 
Ariadne provided him with a ball of thread, which he used to mark his path inside the maze. Theseus ultimately confronted the Minotaur and killed it, freeing Athens from its horrific obligation. Ovid's Metamorphoses and other classical sources provide rich details of the smith. Ovid was a Roman poet as one of the, and is one of the primary sources that document the story of the Minotaur and Theseus. His works are a blend of myth and literature, providing not only just a recounting of the events, but also exploring the psychological and emotional underpinnings of the characters involved. And the labyrinth itself was a symbol of intricate and inescapable, inescapable complexity that has fascinated historians and scholars that have, you know, tried to you know, understand the deeper meaning of these stories. It is often interpreted as a metaphor for the human condition, with the Minotaur rep- representing the darker, untamed aspects of human nature. A uh, <clears throat> couple fun facts and less known aspects of the Minotaur myth include its influence on various cultural works throughout history. Uh, the story of the Minotaur has inspired countless adaptations in literature, art, and popular culture. Uh, for example, Jorge Luis Bo- uh, Borges, an Argentinian writer, was particularly fascinated by labyrinths and frequently explored themes of infinite mazes and mythical creatures in his works. The Minotaur also appears in modern literature, such as in uh, Mary Renault's novel, The King Must Die, which retells the story of Theseus with a historical fiction approach. Additionally, archaeological discoveries in Crete, particularly at the Palace of Knossos, have revealed complex architectural structures that some speculate may have inspired the myth of the labyrinth. So, that or it was an actual labyrinth, and some people are like, uh... <laughs> Was there some fucking bullheaded man thing? <laughs> uh, which no, no, it's it's biologically impossible for a human and a animal to consummate and actually like make it. Well, they can they can fuck. You can definitely fuck an animal, uh, but you will not be able to breed out an animal, uh, at least with anything that's not in the Homo genus genus. Uh, so, not in that genus, you can't really make anything. Uh, it's theorized it may be possible with monkeys, uh, with, uh, with apes and with uh, chimpanzees. But again, no, no success still there, even with the tests that we'll go over later on. Um, <clears throat> but Greece, Greece wasn't just uh, obsessed with about fucking bulls, right? They, <laughs> which is so funny since bulls is uh, a bull is like a nickname for. Like if you're a cuck, you look for a bull to come fuck your wife, you know, and that's, that's exactly what happened here. Uh, it should have been King Cuck instead of King Minos. <laughs> um, but besides bulls, you know, they also wanted to fuck some horses and goats. Um, and so we have the story of centaurs and satyrs. Uh, and these figures are deeply rooted in Greek mythology. They represented the untamed and wild aspects of nature Centaurs are depicted as half human, half horse creatures, often embodying the struggle between civilization and barbarism. Uh, the most famous centaur, uh, Chiron, is an, is an exception to the generally wild and unruly nature of his kind. Unlike his brethren, Chiron is known for his wisdom and knowledge of medicine, and he serves as a mentor to several Greek heroes, including Achilles and uh, Asclep- Asclepius. The duality of centaurs highlights the Greek understanding of the human condition caught between reason and primal instincts. Uh, just again, more of like a commentary on human uh, nature as a part of a part of humanity is still wild, but um, we've developed this like higher learning and higher thinking. And it's again, a lot of these stories are just commentaries on that, on that idea. So satyrs, on the other hand are part of the uh, part human, part goat often depicted with the legs and ears and horns of a goat. They are companions of Dionysus, the god of wine, rev- revelry, and ecstasy, embodying the spirit of uninhibited pleasure and chaos. Satyrs are notorious for their lecherous behavior and love of music and dance. They love fucking. They often appear in Greek literature as symbols of fertility and the natural world's untamed aspects. In plays such as those by Euripides, satyrs provide comic relief and embody the festive, unruly aspects of human nature contrasting sharply with the more ordered society depicted in Greek tragedies. Homer's Iliad and Odyssey provide early references to centaurs, portraying them as savage and unruly beings, often at odds with humans, because humans were its main competition and main source of fucking. The centaurs... (laughs) Just kidding. 
No, uh, the centaurs are, again, this is where we get that like, they're wild and stuff. Um, <clears throat> the centaurs most notable myth involves their battle with Lapis, uh, Lapis, a Thessalian tribe. This conflict arose during the wedding of, um, Pirithios, king of Lapthus, when the centaurs intoxicated by wine, attempted to abduct the bride and other female guests. Uh, again, to go and fuck them. The ensuing battle, known as the Centra, Centauromachi, symbolizes the struggle between civilization and barbarism. This myth was a popular subject in ancient Greek art, illustrating the cultural tension <clears throat> between order and chaos. Euripides plays such as Cyclops and, and corporate satyrs as part of the chorus, blending elements of comedy and drama. The satyr play, a, a genre that compl- combines the structure of tragedy with a chorus of satyrs, was a staple of Athenian festivals, reflecting the duality of human nature, both noble and base. These plays often featured satyrs engaging in humorous antics, providing counterbalance to the serious themes of the accompanying tragedies. <laughs> you know, like if a kid died in the play, they'd come out and be like, ha ha, that's hilarious. <laughs> you know, something like that, basically. <laughs> Uh, the satyrs association with Dionysus uh, further underscores their connection to themes of ex- excess revelry and the breakdown of social norms. And in all reality, uh, when a kid or someone would die in one of those places, they'd probably just come out with their ass hanging out and, you know, people would laugh at the satyr with his bare ass out and they'd be like, ha ha, that's, that's such, that's such a satyr thing to do. Oh man, that's, that's hilarious. What was they said about? Oh yeah, a kid died. Ah, but look at it. Look at him. He, essentially like the clowns of uh, the ancient Greek world. First person accounts from ancient Greek literature offer rich insights into the portrayal of these creatures. Um, again, in metamorphosis, uh, metamorphoses, the, there's a lot of vivid description of centaurs and the interactions with humans. Um, and, yeah, Ovid was you know, super good about this. And, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of influence still enduring from centaurs and um, satyrs appearing in our Western culture. Now uh, the character of Chiron appears in modern li- uh, literature and media, such as uh, Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson series, which I read as a kid. I love that series. I feel like it kind of fell off after uh, I'll be honest, after the end of the first five books uh, or is it six books? After once they started introducing the Roman characters, like I, I kind of read the first like two of the Roman series or three of the Roman series, and then the first uh, two, or I think is it just two of the Egyptian series? I read that one. That one was okay. But then I just couldn't get into it after that. Like I, I haven't even attempted to. Well, they're also made made for kids, so I probably just outgrew them by that point. Um, but yeah. So that's a good series. Um, but again, Chiron here, he, he serves as a mentor to the young uh, demigods. Uh, satyrs were in that too. Satyrs, um, uh, Satyr was the main friend of Percy Jackson, Grover. Um, he was using that book. And so the enduring popularity of these myths speak to their deep rooted appeal, reflecting timeless themes of human nature and the struggle between civilization and wildness and the celebration of life's pleasures. Historians and scholars have long studied the significance of centaurs and satyrs in this mythology. And according to historian Walter Burkett, these creatures symbolize the Greek view of humanity's dual nature uh, between reason and passion. Burkett's analysis highlights the cultural and psychological significance of these myths, showing how they encapsulate fundamental aspects of the human experience overall. Um, guy again, just reiter- reiterizing that point. Um, And then kind of taking it back a little further, uh, going to Egyptian mythology, we have Anubis and Bastet. Um, They were two prominent deities and really all of the deities in uh, in Egypt, right? They're all like human bodied with like animal heads for the most part. But um, Anubis, who is the god of modification and the afterlife, (coughs) is depicted with a human body and the head of a jackal. His association with modification stems from his role in embalming and guiding souls to the afterlife. Uh, he's often depicted performing the weighing of the heart ceremony, which is a critical process in the journey to the afterlife, where uh, the heart is of the deceased is weighed against the feather of Ma'at, uh, the goddess of truth and justice. And if the heart was lighter than the feather, the soul could proceed to the afterlife. If not, it was devoured by the monstrous Amit. Think like Cerberus, essentially, or uh, maybe maybe not Cerberus, but just a big old monster that eats your heart. Uh, I think it might actually be a crocodile, or uh, yeah, it might be a crocodile. I can't remember. Uh, whatever. 
But um, Anubis is jackal head symbolizes his connection to ceremonies in the dead. In ancient Egypt, uh, jackals were often seen around tombs, likely due to their scavenging nature. And this association likely influenced Anubis' role as a protector of graves. So the deity is believed to ensure the, the safe passage of souls perfect, uh, protect the deceased from malevolent spirits in the Book of the Dead. Anubis is frequently invoked to aid the dead in their journey through the Duat, the Egyptian underworld. His presence in tomb paintings and funerary texts underscores his importance in Egyptian religious practices surrounding uh, death and burial. Because death was a big deal in Egypt. It was one of the most important things you could do. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Bastet, the goddess of home, fertility, and uh, domesticity, is depicted with a human body, the head of a lioness, or a domestic cat. Uh, initially, Bastet was portrayed as a lioness, symbolizing her fierce and protective nature. And over time, she became more commonly depicted as a domestic cat, reflecting her association with the home and family. Bastet embodies the dual aspects of nurturing motherhood and ferocity in protecting her offspring. She's also revered as a goddess of music, dance, and joy, often depicted with a uh, sistrum, which was a musical instrument associated with c- celebration. She was the goddess of partying, dudes. She liked to party hard. <clears throat> and the transformation from a lioness to a cat mirrors the evolving relationship between humans and animals in ancient Egyptian society. Cats were highly valued in Egypt for their ability to protect grain stores from vermin and their presence in homes likely contributed to Bastet's association with domesticity and fertility. The city of Bubastis was the center of her worship uh, where an annual festival in her honor drew thousands of devotees. A bunch of cat lovers, basically. Uh, I'm a big cat guy myself, so I kind of get it. You know, cats are cool, man. I, I really like cats. Um, not as much into dogs, uh, like, I don't know, some people are more into dogs than cats, but cats are just so much simpler, man. <laughs> it's so much easier to take care of a cat. Uh, le- legit, you clean out their litter box, you feed and water them, um, and you know, uh, pet them when they want you to. Whereas a dog, you, 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 cl- you pick up the shit and everything, take them out. You have to take them out on walks. You have to sure they're getting enough like socialization. You have to, you know, make sure they're not going to piss all over your car, but you have to like teach them where to potty. A cat usually just comes like pre-programmed knowing to go shit and dirt basically. <laughs> and so as soon as you put out a litter box, it's like, Oh yeah, that's where I want to shit anyway. So we're good. <laughs> Whereas with a dog, it's like pre-programmed to shit everywhere. So, you know, big, big difference there. Anyways, uh, Bastet's cult em- emphasize not only fertility and motherhood, but also the protection of, uh, of the home from both physical and spiritual threats. Uh, there's a bunch of first person accounts from ancient texts and descriptions that provide a bunch of insights into the worship and significance of these deities. Uh, a bunch of tombs often invoke Anubis for protection while temple inscriptions and statues frequently, frequently depict Bastet and her nurturing aspect. The Greek historian Herodotus writing in the fifth century BCE described the grandeur, uh, fifth century BCE. Oh yeah. Fifth century BCE grandeur of Bastet's festival at, uh, Bubastis, noting, the joyous celebrations and the large number of pilgrims who participated in the fest uh, festivities. I, uh, I thought it was like fifth millennium for some reason, like 5,000 BCE, but I was like, that's, that's super wrong, <laughs> but no, no, fifth century, 500. That makes sense. <clears throat> Historians and Egyptologists have extensively studied Anubis and Bastet, highlighting their roles in Egyptian religion and culture um, again. And there's a bunch of other, uh, gods as well, like Ra, um, all, all of their gods, really, all, all of the gods had some sort of animal aspect to them and the animal had significance. And again, for back, back in the day, it was less about trying to embody like the strengths besides the Greeks, the Greeks were the main ones who were like, yeah, so centaurs have like the, uh, <laughs> ability of reason, like humans and the speed of a horse or the, um, the madness of a bull but the versatility of like a human body. I, I don't know. It's, I do know <laughs> it's fucking crazy, man. Um, and they're kind of like the first ones to really try to intermarry or like have humans be boning animals. Uh, the Greeks were all about that. Uh, you know, Zeus has a swan. Uh, <laughs> Zeus has any animal, basically fucking a bunch of different Kings wives. Cause he, he liked to cuck Kings in particular. Uh, that's just his, his favorite pastime to do. He also liked to cuck his wife, Hera. Um, so, and I know I didn't mention a lot of that, uh, but 
I feel like I, that would be like a whole episode. It's just like Zeus cucks. <laughs> maybe, maybe that'll be my next, um, short episode. It's just a, a list of every time Zeus has cucked someone <laughs> comment below. If you guys want me to do that, I'll, I'll make a, make a whole video. I'll make a tier list. Even it'll <laughs> be like, listen, when, when Zeus cucked, uh, it made Heracles. This was a tier because he didn't get away with it. Or, I don't know. Different things. When he made Theseus, that was S tier. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, so again, and uh, for the, for Egyptians, a lot of it was just, uh, reverence and animals being symbolic of, um, different aspects of their, their spiritual journey for Egypt. And again, the Greeks were a bit more grounded in uh, reality. Well, I shouldn't say reality. They're less concerned about death and more concerned about making cool shit or thinking about like, oh, what if like humans and other things boned? So, uh, and there we go. Now, here are the first ins- real historical instances where uh, people think human animals have uh, interbred or um, people like made some sort of monstrosity. So we go to the first count. Uh, the first count that I could find was Gerald uh, Gerald of Wales. He was also known as Geraldus Cambrensis. He was a medieval clergyman and chronicler who traveled extensively and documented his observation in various works. One of his most famous writings is Topographia Hibernica, or Nisa, or yeah, probably Hibernica is a detailed account of his travels in Ireland during the 12th century. This text provides a fascinating, albeit often sensationalized view of Irish society, culture, and landscapes from the perspective of an outsider. Among the many vivid uh, description and tales in Topographia uh, Hibernica, Gerald claims to have witnessed a disturbing and bizarre ritual involving bestiality. According to Gerald, during his travels in Ireland, he encountered a pagan ritual in which a man was observed having intercourse with a horse. Good old-fashioned Irish horse fucking. <laughs> where the Southerners got it from, you know? <laughs> the ritual was purportedly part of a fertility rite intended to ensure the prosperity and fecundity of the land and its people. And Gerald's account is not only a reflection of the superstitions and practices he attributed the, to the Irish, but also serves as a critique of what he perceived as the backward and uncivilized customs of the people he encountered. And I, 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 I don't get his point here. I, I have no idea what's so backward about, you know, good old horse fucking. I think it's uh, perfectly normal um, and definitely, you know, fun activity to do. I think that, you know, if we, if we went back to horse fucking out in public and during our rituals to, invoke some uh, Celtic God to bless our fields. We, we live in a much happier society, but you know, we can't always get what we want. Uh, that's why I do my best uh, to, with all my pagan friends to ensure that they, they are the fucking as many horses as they possibly can, because I want centaurs. Okay. Um, <laughs> also forgot to add um, one of the true first uh, accounts of uh, human interbreeding to make um, to make a human animal hybrid would have been Alexander the Great's father. Uh, if you remember from that episode, uh, when I brought up his centaur breeding program. <laughs> oh man. I, uh, I should have, I should have included that as one of my main sources, uh, from myself. I, I, I source myself as, as, uh, where I get my facts from. It's, it's all in my head. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, his, uh, his writings are filled with similar accounts that blend observation, hearsay, and moral judgment, making it challenging to discern fact from fiction. Uh, so we don't know if this is, you know, true or not. Um, and if they were like, and according to the, him, the ritual would have been to try and essentially make a, a centaur, a, a human horse hybrid. And Gerald's writing provide a unique, though biased, perspective on medieval Irish culture, um, you know, making the Irish seem to be backwards and uh, weird fucking people. His accounts were meant to shock and intrigue his audience, composed mainly of the English and Welsh elite. The story of the man and the horse is a prime example of how Gerald sought to portray the Irish as barbaric 
and in need of reform and civilization brought by the English. His depiction of such rituals was likely exaggerated or entirely fabricated to serve his narrative and the political objectives at the time, which aimed at justifying the English conquest and colonization of Ireland. So there's also that it probably honestly didn't happen. It's probably just more British propaganda to shit on the Irish because they, they love doing that. Right. And they, they, they still kind of love shitting on the Irish. Not as much, uh, but definitely, definitely still love doing that. And so historians view Gerald's accounts with the critical eye, acknowledging his contributions to medieval literature and um, ethnography while also recognizing his biases. According to historian Robert Bartlett, (sighs) Gerald's works are invaluable for their detailed depictions of medieval life, but they must be read with an understanding of his agenda and the context in which he wrote. Bartlett notes that Gerald often used hyperbole and moralistic tones to emphasize the otherness of the cultures he described, reflecting the ethnocentric attitudes of the era. As the British were the superior race, damn it. <laughs> they, they, they like to think of themselves as superior to us horse fucking folk, but how could they? <laughs> That's a terrible accent, I'm sorry. Fun facts about uh, Gerald Wells include his remarkable persistence and ambition, uh, despite being passed over for the position of Bishop of St. David's multiple times. Gerald continued to write prolifically and travel extensively. His works cover not only Ireland, but also Wales, and they include descriptions of geography, folklore, and the natural world. His ability to weave together observation, myth, and political commentary makes his writings both entertaining and informative, albeit with a need for cautious interpretation. You can't take everything that he says with a... um, You gotta take it with a grain of salt, essentially. It's not... If you, if you read it, it's, it's, it's been more of a fun time, a bit more of a fun read. Cause you know, you know, look at it and be like, Oh, that's cool. But it, a lot of it's just, again, it's what the Romans did. Just a bunch of, uh, needless, uh, <clears throat> I guess I wouldn't have to say needless, but just a bunch of exaggerations really. In Topographia Hibernica, Gerald's vivid imagination and Pichant for storytelling come to the fore. Foray. While his accounts provide a window into the medieval mindset and the perceptions of different cultures, they also reveal more about Gerald himself and the society he represented. His works are a testament to the power of narrative in shaping historical and cultural understanding, illustrating how facts can be intertwined with fiction to serve broader social and political purposes. Uh, It really let the British and Welsh elite get away with a lot when it came to Ireland. Because everyone, uh, everyone that, you know, read his accounts saw them as just a bunch of weird old horse fuckers. <laughs> they were like, ah, that's weird. It's weird that they're fucking the horses. How dare they? We must, we must, um, abolish them. We can't let other people be horse fucking. That's only for the British and Welsh elite, damn it. <laughs> we should be the only horse fuckers here. Um, and that's essentially what happened. uh <clears throat> And then in the 11th century, we have the story of Count uh, Guillemus, uh, <clears throat> the Italian cleric and reformer Pietro Damiani recorded a peculiar and secessional story involving Count Guillemus in his treatise De Bono Religiosi Status et Veriorum uh, Animateum Tropologia, according to Diamani, Count, uh, Count Guillermo's pet ape became romantically involved with the Count's wife, leading to the birth of a hybrid offspring. This narrative, while intriguing, is largely considered fictional and serves more as a moral tale than a factual account. But this is the first time that uh, people are like, yeah, apes, uh, apes can be fucking our wives and making babies, damn it. So Damiani's account is filled with vivid details that would have shocked and entertained his contemporaries. He claimed that the ape, driven by jealousy upon seeing the count laying, uh, lying with his wife, attacked and killed the count. And following this violent episode, the ape allegedly became the wife's lover, resulting in the birth of a hybrid creature. This offspring was reportedly shown to Damiani by Pope Alexander II, adding an extra layer of authority and intrigue to the story. However, such tales were often embellished or entirely fabricated to convey moral lessons or reflect their clerical concerns of the time. And it makes me wonder <laughs> what the fucking clerical concern at the time was when in Italy. <laughs> like, was there just a bunch of Italian women and traveling to the Amazon and coming back with ape husbands? They're like, oh, this man is for me. He's, he's more manly than, <laughs> than Pedro. 
Pedro's not manly enough. I need an ape man to take care of my pussy. Like, or is there a bunch of dudes just wanting some ape puss? Like, what the fuck, man? What was the concern? What was the concern? What was the reason for this story? So, <laughs> and so the story of Count uh, Guillermus and the ape is a reflection of the medieval fascination with monstrous births and the boundaries between species. And during this period, tales of hybrid creatures were common and often used to illustrate the consequences of sin and moral corruption. Uh, don't be getting too horny, because if you do, you might get raped by an ape, and yeah, it's going to be real bad for you. <laughs> Essentially. Damian and his work, like many of his contemporaries, use such stories to underscore the dangers of moral decay and the need for religious reform. <laughs> it really was fucked in the... God damn 12th century and the 11th century, man. Like, what the hell was happening? Uh, everyone in Italy was just banging animals, I guess. And he's like, no more bestiality. We can't be allowing this to happen. My wife just fucked the horse again. And I can't compare it to a horse. It's unfair. They have a biological advantage. Oh, my God. Well, he was a priest, so he didn't have a wife, but still... <laughs> He's like, all, all the young choir boys that wanted to fuck the horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna chill out there. Uh, but again, this account serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of coming to base desires and the chaos that can result from breaking natural and divine laws. Even though the couple was married and the ape clearly just attacked and, um, you know, raped the count's wife after he killed the count. And the count's wife was just, you know, super cool with that, I guess. And I was just like, yeah, fuck it. I'll have a baby with this thing. Uh, maybe she just wanted to live, you know, and so she just kind of dealt with it. Um, <clears throat> so clearly historians view Damiani's story with skepticism, uh, saying that it, it was a part of a broader medieval genre of moralizing tales rather than a f- factual report. And according to historian Joyce E. Salisbury, such stories were not uncommon, uncommon in medieval literature and were often used to explore themes of human animal boundaries and the consequences of transgressing social norms. Again, though, it's like she didn't, the Count's wife didn't even fucking cross any social norms. She kind of got forced into the situation after her husband was killed in front of her. <laughs> that one just makes less sense to me. It's like, what? So you, you bang your husband in front of an ape and, you know, that's bad. You, you can't be having sex in front of other people. I, I don't know. I, and it, not expect to get killed or raped afterwards? Like, what? What is, what is the moral justification here? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Salisbury ner- notes that these narratives were a way for medieval writers to grapple with complex and moral <laughs> ethical issues. <laughs> it's not that complex, though. <laughs> so they use exaggerated and fantastical elements to, t- uh, to make their points. <laughs> What was complex about not fucking an ape? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so uh, some of the, some fun facts about the tale of Count Gilemus include it's a, it's placed within a larger tradition of medieval literature. Uh, there is a couple other accounts uh, within here. The fascination can be seen in other medieval texts that describe similar hybrid creatures, often with a mix of horror and wonder. Um, there's ones with, again, horses, ones with dogs, uh, just a bunch of different ones uh, that I was able to find. And so, but this is just one of the main ones. Pietro Damiani himself was a prominent figure in the church reform movement of the 11th century. Uh, he was known for his rigorous asceticism and his efforts to combat corruption within the clergy. His writings, including De Bono Religiosi Stade Severium Animatium Tropologia, were aimed at promoting a strict moral code and highlighting the dangers of moral laxity. The story of Count Gilemus and the Ape, while fictional, served to illustrate the broader themes of his work and the moral imperatives of his time. Through this tale, Damiani sought to convey the importance of maintaining moral and natural order. Again, don't be a fucking the apes or the horses or the dogs. It's a very, it's a very wrong. Okay, using the dramatic, sensational, and the, the sensational to capture the attention of his audience and underscore his message. It's just a, it's a way to get, uh, to get noticed. And here we are, finally, to George Spencer of 1642. 
So, as I said last week, in 1642, George Spencer, who was a laborer and living in the New Haven colony in early colonial America, found himself at the center of a bizarre and tragic case of alleged bestiality. The colony, part of what is now Connecticut, was deeply influenced by puritanical laws and moral codes, which were strictly enforced. Spencer, who had a physical deformity, was accused of having sexual relations with a sow after a deformed piglet was born. The piglet's unusual appearance, which reportedly included a malformed eye that resembled Spencer's, led to suspicion and eventually to formal charges against him. They're like, how dare you have sex? Clearly you had sex with that animal because of your fucked up eye and look at its eye. It's kind of fucked up too in a very similar way. <laughs> and we all know that you're a pig fucker, George. <laughs> a little Georgie, a little pig fucker. And so the evidence against uh, Spencer was circumstantial and heavily reliant on the physical resemblance between him and the piglet. <laughs> Dude was just fucking ugly. They wanted to kill him because he was ugly. This resemblance was seen as a sign of his guilt, reflecting a very deep superstitious and moral beliefs um, that were held at the time. <laughs> so fucked up. You're an ugly motherfucker, so we're going to kill you, <laughs> basically. And you don't believe in God, and that's real bad. Uh, and such cases were not uncommon in the 17th century, uh, where unexplained deformities and animals were often attributed to human sin and moral corruption. Basically. It's, if you were an ugly motherfucker and some animal that you lived nearby gave birth to a deformed looking animal, you, you were, you were fucked. You were going to be accused of bestiality and probably killed. So the new Haven authorities adhering to strict Puritan code took the matter seriously. And Spencer was subjected to intense interrogation, uh, which included cock and ball torture. And under the duress of these proceedings, he confessed to the crime uh, after his balls were stepped on for about, you know, a good solid 20 minutes. Uh, which I would probably confess to, honestly, if I was put under enough CBT. Uh, so I totally understand. <clears throat> Confessions obtained under duress or threat were not unusual during this time, especially in cases invol <coughs> involving moral and religious offenses. Spencer's confession likely coerced by the severe and intimidating questioning and CBT became the primary evidence used against him. The trial reflected the colony's strict adherence to biblical law, which condemned bestiality as a grievous sin punishable by death. Uh, they went old school Bible on him. The court proceedings were swift, and Spencer was convicted based on his confession and the purported resemblance between him and the deformed pig. Uh, however, George Spencer would go back and forth, and you know, after after agreeing to it, thinking he was going to get a lighter sentence, and realizing he wasn't, he would recount his testimony, get tortured again give out his testimony again, uh, recount it. it. It was a back and forth for a little bit, and it, it, it was real fucked up. And the outcome of the trial was grim. Uh, George Spencer was sentenced to death by hanging, a common form of execution for serious crimes in the colonies. His execution was intended not only as punishment, but also as a stark warning to others about the consequences of moral transgressions. Spencer's case is a very sobering example of how superstition, fear, and strict religious codes influenced justice in early colonial America. And really highlighted the harsh realities of life under Puritan rule. Because Puritans were kind of assholes. And any de deviation from the moral code would result in pretty much similar punishment. Death. You'd, you'd be killed. And so historians have viewed the case of George Spencer as emblematic of the Puritans' legal and moral framework. And according to historian John Demos in his book Entertaining Satan, Witchcraft in the Culture of Early New England, such cases were part of a broader pattern of using legal proceedings to enforce community standards and religious orthodoxy. Uh, George Spencer did not fit into the religious orthodoxy. He was an outcast right from the get-go. Uh, the uh, township that he moved from had was reportedly told the New Haven colony the guy was an uh, uh, unrepentant, not God-fearing asshole. And, you know, he wasn't good-looking, so they probably just wanted to get rid of him. And so as soon as that piglet gave birth, they are like, this guy's a known liar. Can't trust a word he says. Uh, I bet he fucked the pig. And bestiality is how we're going to get him. Uh, because they're probably going to get him on a lot of other things um, in terms of getting him. I mean, killing him. So, uh, And this execution of Spencer that was based on dubious evidence and, of course, conf confession illustrates the very precarious nature of justice in society governed by fear and sin and divine retribution. Um... He would be eventually uh, essentially granted clemency uh, or granted a pardon by the governor of New England 
Uh, but as we all know, he was technically convicted under colonial, like colonial law and by a magistrate and under British rule. And so the idea that, uh, <laughs> um, that we came up with is we, uh, we, we are going to send a legal, uh, document over to England, uh, to, to England and, uh, to one of the capital houses, uh, basically petitioning for a pardon or for a posthumous, posthumous pardon. And, uh, here's the letter that my friend has come up with so far. So dear magistrate, I'm writing to formally petition for the posthumous pardon for George Spencer, who was wrongfully convicted and executed in 1642 in the new Haven colony, then under British colonial jurisdiction. This petition is submitted in recognition, in recognition of the miscarriage of justice that occurred and in pursuit of restoring the dignity and the legacy of George Spencer. Big fucker. George Spencer was born in date of uh, birth uh, not known currently, in place of birth not known currently, we believe England somewhere, in, 16, uh, <clears throat> uh, in like 1620 uh, uh, somewhere. So he was convicted of bestiality and executed in New Haven Colony for allegedly fathering a child with a sow. The, the conviction was based on the claim that the piglet born with physical deformities resembled Spencer. It has since come to light that such an accusation is biologically impossible, as it is now scientifically proven that interspecies reproduction between a human and a pig is not possible. The primary grounds for the petition are new evidence, scientific advancements unequivocally demonstrate that it is biologically impossible for, you, for a human to father a child with a sow. This evidence invalidates the primary basis for George Spencer's conviction. Uh, the trial of George Spencer was based on superstitious beliefs and lacked any credible scientific or uh, medical evidence. The legal standards at the time were not met, resulting in a gross miscarriage of just justice. At <clears throat> historical precedent, there have been several cases where the British government has granted posthumous pardons for historical wrongs, such as the case of Derek Bentley and Alan Turing. George Spencer's case similar sim similarly warrants such a rectification. Included with this petition are the following supporting documents. Copies of the original court records and the trial transcripts from the New Haven col Colony, scientific reports, and expert analysis um, detailing the biological impossibility of interspecies reproduction between humans and pigs. Statements from historians and legal experts affirming the wrongful nature of the conviction. Affidavits from descendants of relevant parties. Any other relevant documents have also been included. Given the compelling evidence to George Spencer's and innocence and the grave miscarriage of justice that occurred, I respectfully request that Her Majesty's government grant a post or His Majesty's government granted a posthumous pardon to George Spencer. This act would not only rectify a historical wrong, but also reaffirm the commitment to justice and fairness. Thank you for considering the, this petition. I'm available for any further information or clarification needed. Yours sincerely. And I'm not going to read out his name. So <laughs> there we go, guys. We have a letter that we're prepared to send. Uh, if anybody wants to, you know, I guess join in the petition and, you know, just like uh, write in their own, email of like what they think should be done here uh we can include it in, in the long long list of papers that we're going to mail off to a uh, magistrate's house in new in, in england so uh feel free to do that we probably won't be done for like a month or two i'll give updates uh if we ever get anything back or hear anything about it so uh, please write in with your own reasons why you think uh, george spencer should be uh uh, again, pardoned by the British government specifically, specifically. So, um, and then not that long after, um, George Spencer, we actually have the case of Thomas Hogg in 1647, Thomas Hogg, who was a resident of the new Haven colony in early colonial America, found himself embroiled in a scandalous and serious accusation of bestiality. The colony was also adhering to Puritan laws and moral, moral codes. Um, well, still was, and they were shocked when two deformed piglets were born <laughs> and suspicion quickly fell upon Hogg. So after George Spencer was dead, they're like, well, shit, who else would be doing it? And the physical de deform deformities of the piglets were perceived as a sign of unnatural acts. And the, given the superstitious and religious mindset of the time, Hogg was accused of having engaged in sexual relations with the South. They also just didn't like Hogg either. So uh, the case against Hogg was largely based on circumstantial evidence and the unusual appearance of the piglets combined with the moral panic and, fe uh, and fear of sin pervasive in the community led to his arrest and trial. And the Puritans, 
much like other uh, of New Haven Colony, much like other colonies at the time, viewed such acts as severe transgressions against both divine and natural law. And during his trial, Hogg maintained his innocence. And unlike George Spencer, who had been executed for similar crime five years earlier, Hogg did not confess to the charges. The lack of a confession and the nature of the evidence presented a dilemma for the authorities. The trial records indicate that the community and the court were deeply divided on the appropriate course of action. The absence of direct evidence and Hogg's refusal to admit guilt complicated the proceedings. Even with cock and ball torture, man did not give in. He was like, listen, I did not have sex with that pig. Y'all are fucking crazy. And you guys can keep stamping on my balls if you want. <laughs> so as a result, the court decided on a punishment that was severe, uh, uh, severe yet stopped short of execution. Thomas Hogg was sentenced to be whipped and imprisoned. And so uh, they whipped and beat the shit out of him. And honestly, based off of the fact that he didn't submit to the torture, he probably enjoyed it a little bit. So uh, this punishment was just intended to serve as both a deterrent to others and a means of maintaining public order and moral discipline. Uh, and uh, hopefully to stop them sows from having to form piglets, damn it. Hogg's whipping was a public event designed to shame him and reinforce the community's strict adherence to Puritan values. And so the imprisonment that followed was meant to further isolate him and uh, serve as a prolonged reminder of his alleged transgressions. They're like, listen, you pig fucker. I don't care if you say you're not a pig fucker. You're a pig fucker. You, you're going to be in here until you, do you realize what you did was wrong? Even though you never, you know, you keep saying you didn't do it. God damn it. Um, again, in, in a similar, uh, historians, very similar to, George Spencer's case to view this as a, uh, again, just a way of New Haven colony to um, sort of subjugate some of his residents to these punishments and sort of to uh, clear out any bad, bad eggs essentially out of their, out of their group here. So unlike, uh, <clears throat> again, unlike Spencer's case, which in an execution hogs comparatively lighter sentence reflects a judicial system grappling with the complexities of evidence and confession. And this case illustrates the Puritan struggle to balance the religious zeal with the practicalities of justice. And I had a hard, hard ass time dealing with that. Cause you know, that's just how Puritans are. If you, if you really want to get into it. Um, <clears throat> Anyways, uh, one year later in 1648, Thomas Hogg would actually end up getting convicted of having sex uh, after being caught in the middle of the act with having sex with a pig. Um, he, and there would be about five witnesses that say that he did it and he would uh, hang for that. So uh, however, no piglets would be born out of the union. And the colonists were a little shocked being like, okay, so we caught him dead ass having sex with a pig this time, but the pig didn't have any weird looking babies. These, these babies came out normal. And, you know, it just made them question a bunch of things. <laughs> just fucking with you. No, 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 no. He did not do that. <clears throat> okay. And then in the mid 19th century, uh, we have some speculations that were inspired by Darwin. The publication of Charles Dar uh, Darwin's groundbreaking work on the origin of species in 1859 revolutionized the scientific community and public understanding of biology. Darwin's theory of evolution uh, by natural selection suggested that all species, including humans, shared, a com shared common ancestors. This radical idea led to intense speculation and debate about the nature of these evolutionary relationships, particularly between humans and their closest relatives, the great apes. While Darwin himself did not propose or condone the creation of human-ape hybrids, his theories spurred public imagination and scientific curiosity about the possibilities of such interspecies connections. And so the public reaction to Darwin's theories was incredibly mixed, ranging from enthusiastic acceptance to vehement opposition. Because uh, God wouldn't allow that, damn it. How dare you? And not to shit on your potatoes, Darwin, but did you forget about God? <laughs> shit like that going on, basically. Among the many questions his work raised, one that captured significant attention was whether humans could interbreed with other primates. This speculation was fueled by anatomical and genetic similarities Darwin highlighted between humans and apes. Victorian society, already fascinated by the natural world and its mysteries, began to wonder, began to ponder the implications of such hybridization. Though no documented science... I could say it fucking easily that time, hybridization. Though no documented scientific attempts were made during this period. The mere possibility of human-ape hybrids sparked both curiosity and ethical concerns. People didn't really want to be fucking apes, okay? 
And so discussions within the scientific community reflected these diverse reactions. Some scientists entertained the theoretical feasibility of human-ape hybrids as a means to further understand evolutionary processes. For instance, Thomas Huxley, who was a staunch supporter of Darwin, used comparative, uh, used comparative anatomy to argue for the close relationship between humans and apes, reinforcing the idea that such, that such hybridization might be biologically plausible. However, the lack of technological means and ethical considerations at the time prevented any actual experimentation. Though um, this would come out later, the Thomas Huxley in a journal did in fact mate with a female ape. Uh, the ape, however, did crush his testicles during the act, thus causing him to come blood, not regular semen. Um, he would eventually need to have surgery, life-saving surgery, uh, would no longer have balls afterwards either. And so these speculative discussions were more about exploring the lim limits of evolutionary theory rather than a serious proposals for creating hybrids, especially after the incident. Oh. <laughs> Anyone that believed that, I'm sorry. Again, I'm just having a good time here. Could you fucking imagine? However, in the broader cultural context, Thomas Huxley did not have sex with a female ape. I'm just saying that now. The idea of human-ape hybrids appeared in literature and popular media, often reflecting societal anxieties about evolution and its implications for human identity. For example, the infamous monkey trial of 1925, where John Scopes was tried for teaching evolution in a Tennessee public school, highlighted the ongoing critical cl uh, cultural clash between evolutionary science and traditional religious beliefs. While this trial occur occurred decades after Darwin's initial publication, it underscored the enduring controversy and fascination with the evolutionary relationship between us humans and apes. So, and then historians like Adrian Desmond and James Moore uh, in their comprehensive biography, Darwin, the life of a tormented evolutionist delved into the profound impact of Darwin's work on the 19th century thought. Uh, <clears throat> they note that Darwin's theories fundamentally challenged the established views of human uniqueness and divine creation, leading to both scientific inquiry and societal upheaval the speculation about human ape hybrids, while not pursued scientifically at the time, was part of, of the broader intellectual and cultural shift that Darwin's work would instigate and would lead to in the 1920s with Ilya Ivanov. So in the early 1920s, uh, Soviet biologist Ilya Ivanov embarked on a controversial series of experiments aiming to create a human chimpanzee hybrid or the human Z. Ivanov, an expert, an expert in artificial insemination, had previously achieved success in creating hybrid animals such as the Z-donk, which is a cross between a zebra and a donkey. Encouraged by these successes and driven by the Soviet government's interest in using science to push the boundaries of human capability and challenge religious orthodoxy, Ivanov proposed experiments to inseminate female chimpanzees with human sperm. <laughs> They'd just get a bunch of dudes jacking off into cylinders, essentially, and then even off would go in and artificially inseminate the female chimpanzees. Uh, pretty fucked up, though. Ivanov's project received support and funding from the Soviet government, which saw potential in the research uh, to demonstrate the power of Soviet science to provide and to provide evidence for Darwinian evolution over religious explanations of human origins. In 1926, Ivanov traveled to French Guinea, uh, Guinea or yeah, Guinea, to begin his experiments. Despite his extensive preparations, the task proved challenging, capturing and maintaining a sufficient number of chimpanzees, as well as finding local women willing to participate in the experiments has proved to be significant obstacles. So uh, it wasn't just female uh, chimpanzees either. It was also male chimpanzees, sperm, uh, injecting them to human uh, females. So the initial phase of the experience involved in submitting female chimpanzees with human sperm. Ivanov's hopes rested on the anatomical and genetic similarities between humans and chim chimpanzees. However, all attempts to produce a viable pregnancy failed. Ivanov faced new numerous logistical and ethical challenges, including the difficulty of ensuring the health and safety of both the chimpanzees and the human participants. Despite these setbacks, Ivanov was undeterred and sought to continue his research in the Soviet Union where he believed he would have a better control over the experimental conditions. Back in the Soviet Union, Ivanov faced increasing scrutiny and opposition from both the scientific community and the government. Uh, the ethical implications of his work, combined with the, his, its lack of success, led to mounting criticism. In the late 1920s, political changes within the Soviet Union further complicated Ivanov's situation with Joseph Stalin's rise to power. There's a shift toward more conservative and pragmatic scientific agendas. 
and Ivanov's research was viewed as politically and scientifically untenable. And so in 1930, Ivanov was arrested during the political purge, purges that targeted many intellectuals and scientists, and he was charged with involvement in anti-Soviet activities and exiled to Kazakhstan, where he continued to work on less controversial aspects of veterinary science until his death in 1932. Ivanov's attempt to create a human-chimpanzee hybrid ended in failure, but his experiments remain a significant, if controversial, chapter in the history of genetics and evolutionary biology. Historians and scientists have since reflected on Ivanov's work as a cautionary tale about the ethical boundaries of scientific research. And according to Kirill Rosinov, a historian of science, Ivanov's experiments were indicative of the uh, period's broader ideological and scientific ambitions, but also highlighted the dangers of pushing ethical boundaries in pursuit of scientific knowledge uh, because of how fucked up it was. There's a, there's a lot more detail I could go in (laughs) about this guy, but, um, I don't want to be sitting here just explaining how uh, some ch- female chimpanzees were raped and uh, potentially some Islanders were raped. Uh, a bunch of different um, really fucked up shit went on uh, with even off. So uh, potentially uh, some of it is hearsay. So, and that's, yeah. In the 1960s, however, uh, Chinese scientists embarked on the, on an ambitious and ethically contentious project to create a human chimpanzee hybrid as well. Uh, again, being referred to here as the human Z. And uh, the experiments were t- conducted at a time when China was undergoing significant political and social upheaval. The Cultural Revolution, which was initiated by Mao Zedong in 1966, sought to radically transform Chinese society, promoting com- communist ideology and purging elements considered uh, bourge- bourgeoisie or counter-revolutionary. This period was marked by extreme social and political turbulence, uh, which had profound impacts on all aspects of life, including scientific research. And despite the volatile environment, the initial phase of the human Z experiment proceeded that reflected a bold, albeit controversial pursuit of scientific knowledge that they had. The project faced numerous challenges from the outset, maintaining a healthy and stable environment for the chimpanzees and ensuring the ethical treatment of both the animals and Human participants uh, were significant concerns, and moreover, the technological and scientific limitations at the time made the process highly complex and fraught with difficulties. Um, by highly complex, it meant uh, some some dudes were out there fucking chimps, and some chimps were out there fucking girls. So you know, uh, some uh, females. Yeah. And despite these obstacles, the scientists managed to inseminate a female chimpanzee with human sperm, hoping to observe the development of a hybrid embryo. However. Because of the cultural revolution, this severely disrupted a bunch of scientific activities across China. And many scientists and intellectuals were targeted, and research institutions faced intense scrutiny and ideological purges. As a result, the human Z experiment was abrupt, abruptly halted. And the political climate made it impossible to continue such con- controversial research, despite the fact that a chimpanzee was, in fact, officially inseminated like they did they did get the um get them pregnant <clears throat> however the female chimpanzee that was inseminated died from neglect and lack of proper care during this period and effectively ended the experiment however they were able to get a chimp pregnant with human sperm so there is a possibility here that humans could essentially crossbreed with chimps at the very least um, <clears throat> reflecting on these events, however, uh, historians and ethicists have debated the motivations and implications of such experiments. Scholar Jan Baito, in his anal- analysis of science during the Cultural Revolution, notes that the human Z experiment exemplifies the extreme ambitions and ethical blind spots of, the period, uh, of that period's scientific community. Jan's work highlights how the political ideology and scientific curiosity can intersect, often with troubling consequences. The Chinese experiments of the 1960s remain a very controversial chapter in the, in the history of genetics and evolutionary biology. It illustrated a complex interplay between scientific ambition and ethical considerations and political context. And then, in 2017, we have human pig chimeras. Scientists embarked on groundbreaking, ethically charged experiment to create human pig chimeras. However, this was just to row human organs within animals for transplantation processes. The experiments were conducted by a team led by Dr. Juan Carlos Ispisua Belmonte at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in California. 
The process involved injecting human um, pluripotent stem cells into pig embryos, which were then allowed to develop in the laboratory. The rationale behind using pigs for this research lies in their physiological similarities to humans. Pigs are already used for various medical purposes, such as heart valve transplants, which is true. Uh, That was another option is I could have a part of a pig heart uh, take over part of my heart uh, for the open heart surgery that I may have to get if I don't try to, you know, maintain my health uh, in my, by my fifties, the sixties, somewhere around there. We'll see. <clears throat> and due to the compatibility of their organs with human biology. So by creating chimeric embryos, embryos that contain cells from two different species, the researchers hope to direct, uh, to direct the development of human cells into specific organs within the pig embryos. And this technique could potentially lead to the growth of human compatible organs that are less likely to be rejected by the recipient's immune, immune system. The initial phase of the experiment involved creating over 2000 pig embryos into which human cells were introduced. These chimeric embryos were then implanted into surrogate cells and allowed to develop for several weeks. The researchers monitored the development of these embryos closely, focusing on how the human cells integrated and contributed to the formation of tissues and organs within the pig embryos. The goal was to determine the feasibility of growing functional human organs in a controlled ethical manner. However, The research team faced significant ethical considerations. Development of human-animal chimeras raises profound questions about the moral status of such beings, the potential for unintended consequences, and the humane treatment of the animals involved. To address these concerns, the embryos were terminated at an early stage of development, typically around 28 days, before the formation of complex organs or nervous systems. Uh, They got the abortion treatment. The approach was intended to balance the scientific goals of the research with ethical responsibilities. So... Ensuring that the embryos did not develop a state at to a stage where they might experience pain or suffering, which is fair. They just wanted to see how human cells would interact there. And the outcome of these experiments provided very valuable insights into the potential and limitations of human animal chimeras. While the human cells were found to survive and integrate within the pig embryos, the level of integration was relatively low. This indicated that significant challenges remained in optimizing the conditions for human cell growth and differentiation between uh, within a pig host. Nonetheless, the research represented a critical step forward in the quest to develop viable human organs for transplantation. Reflecting the implications of this research, bio, um, bioethicists and scientists have engaged in extensive discuss- discussions about the future of human-animal chimera research. And according to Dr. David Resnick, a bioethicist at the National Institutes of Health, the creation of a chimera poses very complex dilemmas that require careful consideration and regulation. He emphasizes the importance of developing clear ethical guidelines to govern such research, balancing the potential benefits for human health with respect for animal welfare and you know, moral concerns as well. And then in 2019, um, we, have some, we have some human monkey chimeras uh, that start to take place so and uh these ones uh again they would stop well before the formation of complex structures such as the nervous system or organs and the research would yield important findings the integration of human cells into monkey embryos demonstrated that it is possible to create human primate chimeras albeit with low efficiency The human cells survived and began to differentiate within the embryos, but achieving higher levels of integration and functional uh, functional development remains a significant challenge still. We could, in theory, create actual human monkey chimeras. It is completely based off of this research and evidence that was done uh, by this team. Humanzies are entirely possible. Um, And that is where we are going to end today's episode You blew it up! You animals, you ruined it! Uh, however that goes from Planet of the Apes. 
so yeah yeah planet of the apes is in uh, humanity's future if we so want it to be essentially um it may be a planet of human monkey hybrids but um it is entirely possible that 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 could be another step creating stronger faster or smarter essentially just chimps and uh, monkeys or you know if you if you want to think about it that way it's just creating uh stronger humans um with like monkey like strength essentially but with the higher functioning uh, thought and reason of a human brain i mean that's kind of nuts to think about um <clears throat> so yeah there's that uh <laughs> That's fun. Super monkey human hybrid soldiers. I'll be crazy. Uh, what'd you guys think about today's episode? Um, did you find it fascinating, fun, boring? Uh, let me know. Let me know if you're listening to this on YouTube, tell, tell me in the comments or you can email me at historical corals at gmail.com and, uh, you know, tell me your thoughts there, or you can leave a review on Spotify or podcast. Uh, next week we'll be diving back into some, again, just like kind of more normal quarrels in a way, you know, kind of like picking a war and going over that or picking over, uh, picking a battle or I might end up doing another true crime episode again. Eventually I do eventually want to do an episode on, um, fucking Jack the Ripper or something. That'd be cool. That'd be fun. But We'll see. We'll we'll see. I, I probably won't give too much extra detail than has already been given. Uh, I may give some funny takes on it though. This that'll, that'll be interesting. Um, <clears throat> other than that, we have uh, no no big announcements besides the fact that uh, I guess Hard Homies podcast is now transitioned into essentially a improv D and D game between me and my buddies every Thursday now. Uh, so. If you guys are into that, you can look forward to that every week. Uh, we just come up with like absurd scenarios and then try and get out of it using D like rolling D and D dice, essentially. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a good time. It's a, it's a fun one. If you, if, if you're into that, if you're into like improv D and D type humor, uh, please check out hard homies podcast. I, I think you guys will enjoy it. Um, I am going to be trying to make, uh, start trying to make more shorts and, uh, create like more of like video, uh, products for you guys on the, ch on the channel. So be on the lookout for that hopefully here in the next couple months. And then, like I said, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we will be getting new intros and outros here, hopefully relatively soon. Um, other than that though, don't have a whole lot else. I'm recording this on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there and all uh, single mothers that have to play both roles. Uh, that can be really tough. Um, trust me, I grew up in a single parent household, so I get it. So, um, yeah, no. If you hope you guys are doing good, I hope you guys are um, living life to the fullest and doing the do whatever you can just to you know keep yourself happy, keep yourself uh, going day to day. I love you all. You have a good one. Bye.